is the best for last, which is a discussion of lawmakers and policy uh, advisors, their views on sort of the next evolution. So the, the, we, the previous panel were states that have implemented something and some of the, uh, the challenges and successes that they had. Now we're going to have a conversation about those states that are looking at implementing something for the 2016 legislative cycle. Leading us in this discussion is Angela Antonelli. She is the executive director for the Center for Retirement Initiatives at Georgetown University McCourt School of Public Policy. She has been affiliated with the McCourt School since 2012 as an adjunct teaching housing policy and financial, uh, financial and public management. During her career, Ms. Antonelli has held senior management positions developing and overseeing the implementation of financial services, housing, labor, and other economic policies for the White House Office of Management and Budget and as the Chief Financial Officer for the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development, HUD. Angela, it's all yours. Thank you so much. Well, you know, moderators of the final panel always say, yeah, state, well, state the obvious, which is, I'm assuming, yeah, it is. Uh, between you, dinner, drinks, and all of that. So we'll try to keep things moving here and hopefully keep it lively for you all. But again, thanks to Hank for putting this great event together, and I hope it's been uh, a great educational uh, opportunity and networking opportunity for states to get together and talk about this uh, incredibly important issue. Um, the focus of this panel is SIRS 2.0 and state policymakers' viewpoints on the next evolution. And really, from my perspective, it's a discussion about where do we go from here? Um, how are other states viewing the problem of retirement insecurity? the role of the state in facilitating addressing the issue, and the range of options that can be considered. Now, we've already heard, obviously, in the prior panel, states that are, have enacted laws and particular designs and are moving forward in dealing with the implementation challenges. You know, states are often where the policy and the program innovation begins, and as we well know, this can make good sense because not all states are the same. Politically, they're different. Demographically, they're different and their economic base can be quite different. So the solutions may need to be different. The goal, however, I think we all agree on, and that is achieving greater income security for our retirees. So our goal is the same, but the road that we may need to take to get there may very well be different. And you know, as I sit here, and the Georgetown Center for Retirement Initiatives is just a little over a year old, I, I have to say for a lot of us, if you asked us a year ago, would we have predicted sitting here with four of the five states in that previous panel, um, three, of those, three of the states having enacted their laws in 2015, um, putting these new programs into place, and then several other states launching initiatives to study options for their states. Um, and we have tre um, State Senator Todd Weiler with us today, where Utah is one of those study states along with Virginia that enacted a study law to join Connecticut, Minnesota, and others that are looking at this issue. Uh, and then more than half the states that are considering legislation of one kind or another. So this is all an incredibly encouraging development, and we hope that states will continue to, to move forward. Um, and uh, you know, and as, as has been mentioned, um, we're so happy that Assistant Secretary Boisley was here today to talk about what, which has been a very critical issue for a lot of states, and as they contemplate whether to move forward, how to move forward uh, on the ERISA issue. So we look forward um, to having some clarity around that. As previous panelists had said, it's an incredibly important issue to get some clarity around. Um, and it will have an impact on, I think, the 2016 legislative session and the extent to which other states will, will jump into this and move forward um, and revisit uh, the proposals that they, they tried to move forward in advance in 2015, and hopefully they'll continue to do that. And again, you know, we don't need to review the nature of the problem. I think all of us here, we know there's a problem with low levels of retirement savings, that workers are more likely to save if there's a plan available through their employer. And significant behavioral research shows us that there are ways to design these savings plans that is welcome both by small businesses and their employees, and it significantly increases their likelihood to take advantage of them if we are successful in keeping it simple and low cost and thus easy to access and to use. So I'm delighted to be part of uh, this great panel of legislators and policy experts from the states that have been among those who have clearly demonstrated an interest and a concern for issues of retirement security 
and they really do represent a spectrum of actions and potential for action in the states to be taken to to, to be taken in the future to address this issue. Um, and again, we have Senator uh, Todd Weiler from Utah, again, one of the few states along with Virginia, um, in the 2015 legislative session enacted a study bill with an emphasis on working with the small business community to find a solution. And he's shown great leadership along with Treasurer Richard Ellis of Utah uh, in launching this working group in his state. And from uh, what I've already seen uh, in the my interactions with the Treasurer and, and your working group is they have some unique and innovative ways that they're looking in Utah that the state could in fact create more accessible and effective options for private sector workers. Um, Senator Weiler is a Republican representing Utah's 23rd district. Um, he's a lawyer and businessman and from what I can tell from interviews that I've read about you, you have uh, public service in your blood. So again, we're grateful to have you uh, taking the leadership role in Utah that you have. Representative Carbaugh, we're happy to have you here from the great state of Indiana, a Republican representative from the Fort Wayne area. And, you know, we're happy to have you because, as I understand it, your background is in the financial services industry and as an independent financial advisor. So we've talked a lot about the financial services industry and how they have played in the debate about retirement security and these initiatives in the state. So we look forward to your thoughts and comments about um, the great state of Indiana and how you view these issues and quite honestly the position of the financial services industry from your perspective on how we develop these plan designs. And then we also have <coughs> Representative Cindy Evans from the great state of Hawaii who has been serving in her house district. Um, I just love to go move there. Can you take me home with you? <laughs> I want to be in Hawaii since 2003 she's been serving. And again Hawaii's been among the most progressive states and with respect to employee benefits and Again, we welcome. She's been um, the past few years really focused on the public pension issue and unfunded liabilities in her state and tackling that challenge. Um, and she has an interest in retirement issues. So we're very delighted to have her perspective uh, on this group as well. And then last but not least, Gary. Hi, Gary. How are you? With the Economic uh, Opportunity Institute here in Seattle. And it's been my great pleasure to work with EOI and with John Burbank, who is the founder and leader of EOI. And, you know, Gary is joining us. He's been working on retirement security for a lot of years and has a tremendous amount of experience and has worked with Senator Mullet and EOI, has been working with a lot of folks in Washington State and their Washington State Small Business Marketplace that's been adopted. But Gary also has worked with a lot of other states over the years that have tried to take these, uh, take on this, uh, take on this challenge and develop solutions. So, again, we're glad Gary could join us to offer his perspective. So I just wanted to start off with, you know, with our panelists with a very general question. Um, and if we can maybe start, we'll start with uh, Senator Weiler and then work around the group. So when you think about your interest and your state interests in addressing the challenge of retirement insecurity, how would you view efforts being taken to help people save more for retirement? How do you think your state is similar to and or different to what we've heard from other panelists and the action taken in the states. And then how would you measure success? How do you think about success when you think about dealing with the issue of retirement security and what that means? Thank you. I, I think that um, Utah is probably very reflective of the rest of the country when it comes to retirement. Um, um, we, we know that there's a, a, a great uh, dearth of retirement savings in Utah. Um, in, in specifically in Utah, 52.6% of our private sector workers have no access to a retirement plan like a 401k at work through their employer. And um, nationally, 14% of businesses with fewer than 100 employees offer their employees retirement savings or pension account. I think success would be a program um, that uh, I think the state would launch that would, number one, be successful in terms of it it keeps on going, <laughs> and number two, um, that would be low cost, and we've heard that. Um, and one of the things we've looked at in Utah is making it mandatory that they receive digital statements uh, as opposed to the, the mailed out statements um, through the post office, and um, maybe just starting with one plan. Th this, is, this is the plan, this is again for employees who work for businesses that don't offer their own 401k or other, uh, you know, SEP IRA type of account, um, take it or leave it. We, in Utah, we have a very successful 529 savings plan 
in fact, when um, Supreme Court Justice, Chief Justice John Roberts uh, had to make his financial disclosures when he was being considered by the Senate, it came out that he invests in the Utah 529 plan, and I, I think he's one of at least two Supreme Court justices that invest there. We also uh, launched the first um, small business insurance exchange program in the country, Avenue H, um, which probably would have folded had the ACA not become law, but now it's, it's doing quite well. So one of my objectives in Utah is to build off the success of our 529 plan and the success of our Avenue H insurance exchange and try to, try to roll that into a successful Avenue R type of experience for retirement. First of all, thanks for inviting me, and um, thank you for everyone who stayed around. I appreciate it. Um, you know, in Hawaii, we have uh, people live the longest in Hawaii, and so we have this huge aging population that is really a problem, and it's a blessing and a curse. Um, we know that we know the percentages are, are increasing every year with the baby boomers, and we expect people to live over 90. Um, so we're coming to that realization that, you know, we have a problem. Um, the other, but I do want to comment on, I'm a legislator that believes in having a lot of tools in the toolbox, so I'm very excited that, you know, for this to be considered. Um, but one of the problems we have in Hawaii is that the small business community is really the economic engine, I believe, of the state. Uh, we do have 25% uh, of our economy is military, 30% of our economy is tourism. Um, the employees that work at the resorts um, don't make a lot of money. Um, and then the rest of it is really small business and agriculture, and they employ predominantly five employees or less. Um, and what I hear from my constituent small business is they're very upset with how we regulate them in the state of Hawaii, the amount of income tax uh, that we require of them. Um, so if I believe that, that we should explore it, but the environment we're in is we have to support small business. Um, I believe, you know, we need to focus on helping these small businesses be successful. In, uh, in the context of this retirement savings, I personally believe it'll have to be voluntary to make it fly in Hawaii. Uh, mandatory, I think, is going to be a real problem. Um, again, the type of feedback we get from small businesses, we're just not very friendly to them. So I think we're going to have to really work with them over the next couple of years, given the fact um, that we're, we're just aging out. And the other problem we have in Hawaii is the cost of living is very expensive in Hawaii. And what happens is, um, luckily we have a Hawaiian and a Japanese culture that's kind of the predominant um, race in Hawaii, and they still believe in helping and taking care of their parents and their siblings. So what we have is this concept called ohana in Hawaii. So what happens is you have families that support and take care of each other. So even if the cost of living is high, there is some cultural expectation that you will help your parents and your brothers and sisters. And so my only big question I never got around to is, is how do we really, into this retirement savings that we're talking about, how are we going to insert kind of the cost of living uh, increase that will probably come along in 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 years uh, when I have people come into my office that are 18 to 22 years of age, I try to shock them into savings by telling them, uh, guess what, you're going to live to be 125. I mean, you're 20 now, but you're going to be 125, so you better think about saving some money, get your education, and figure out how you're going to have a comfortable lifestyle between the age of 70 and 125 or whatever, because technology, if we look at it, technology is proven. I think metal technology is going to they're going to live to be 125. Right now, they live to be 100, 110, some. But anyway, thank you. Well, uh, thank you, Angela, and thank you, Hank, for the opportunity to be here. And I do thank you all for sticking around. I think um, uh, our goal in Washington State really is to help prepare uh, the many, many people who don't have any retirement savings right now to be able to 
um, save a little bit. You know, you need to save just a little bit. That's going to be a big help um, come retirement time, and hopefully it'll allow people to live independently longer. And and uh, also, it's a it's a uh, savings for the state when people have their own incomes to uh, rely upon and don't have to rely on the state for state services. I think um, our, our model is very unique. You know, we're looking at trying to be a matchmaker in a sense, matching up individuals with a private sector uh, financial uh, industry um, uh, company and, and those products. And so our measures are going to be very different than the other states where they're going to have a, a good counts of the number of people participating and really good counts of how much money is coming in. We're going to have to figure out ways. I'm, I'm ho very hopeful that we'll be able to figure out ways to work with those companies that are on the marketplace to collect data on the number of companies that enroll, on the number of individuals that enroll, on how much people are setting aside into their accounts. And uh, I think one question that, um, that comes up a lot is about leakage. And I would just, I would just throw this out as something to, to consider. Um, a lot of the folks who are going to be saving are people who are lower income. And right now, lower income people often don't have a, a set-aside savings account, um, don't have money set aside for emergencies. So thinking about leakage, it may not be a bad thing if people are able to draw from uh, their retirement account uh, into those allowable areas, such as I think healthcare emergencies, for example. Um, if right now they're having to go to a payday lender to get money, if they're not having to do that, but rather they can pull from their retirement account and eventually pay it back as they can, um, that would be a better thing than going to payday lenders. So keep leakage, I think, is a little different than what we might be typically thinking of leakage. Well, thank you, Angela and Hank, for allowing me to come. Uh, Treasurer uh, Mitchell in Indiana would love to be here. She couldn't be here. Um, she is a Republican and very interested in this, so from the last panel uh, that maybe banged on Republicans we on this We tried to issue. mix it up a little politically yeah. here on this. Well, this our, our neighbor panel. to the west, you know, <laughs> Illinois. But anyway, uh, <coughs> we can teach them about pensions in Indiana. Um, <laughs> anyway, uh, you know, uh, when I look at this issue, uh, this there was a bill last year, didn't move. Um, you know, there was concerns. AARP was very involved um, and, and very willing to work with the, the financial services industry. NAFA representatives worked uh, with that NAFA being National Association of Insurance Financial Advisors, uh, which I'm a member of. Um, you know, by the end of the session, it was kind of a time ran out situation, I really believe, because uh, we got to a point where NAFA was comfortable. Um, and I think it's, it's going to be more along the lines of voluntary um, I think politically in Indiana, there'd be a lot of hesitation. Um, you know, our, our makeup there, we have Republican governor and both uh, House and Senate's controlled by Republicans. So we have a really conservative uh, population and uh, government forcing something on somebody, even if it's a good thing, uh, gets looked crossways. So I think politics might get in the way of a, of a mandatory. When I look at the issue, I, I, I try to figure out, you know, how did we get here? Uh, how do we get to a point where we have this retirement insecurity, and I think, I think what we're dealing with is um, my grandparents. Uh, you know, they didn't have to save in these types of accounts because they they retired with pensions, they retired with lifetime health care, and therefore they didn't teach their children about saving in this in this manner. They would teach about savings for emergency, but but when you're creating your retirement account with the dawn of the 401k and the phase out of pensions. I think um, one area, we, we, we've all heard education, that's one thing too I think that's a part of this uh, from a bigger scope is we need to address curriculum and schools. Uh, you know, locally in Fort Wayne we have junior achievement, I, I assume uh, similar programs around the country uh, that go in and you know, we'll have JA for a day and I've taught those classes, they go into a middle school classroom and and uh, they're just glad their teacher's not up there yelling at them. <laughs> and uh, some pay attention, some don't. Um, but you teach them about credit, you teach them about uh, saving, compound interest, those simple things that maybe get touched on in a, in a traditional math class, but really there's no um, risk management, investment management, savings curriculum now in education. So I think part of this really is long term um, for my kids and grandkids will be also changing our education system a bit. Well, to continue to follow up on where do we go from here, um, based on what you heard from the earlier panel and the design in, in some of these other states, I mean, what's your, what's your thinking about state facilitated approaches and sort of the details? Now, 
Representative Kalbar sort of already just touched on this, and he thinks in Indiana it's probably more likely to be a voluntary approach. Senator Weller, in, in Utah, what do you think in terms of characteristics, voluntary, non-voluntary, RISA, <coughs> not ERISA, and IRA, Well, one thing I heard this morning was if it's mandatory, it's going to come under ERISA supervision, and I think that's a deal breaker. Not, not the mandatory, not the mandatory versus involuntary, but the ERISA versus non-ERISA. We're the state is uh, state of Utah and our treasurer, Richard Ellis, uh, who's not here today but wishes he could be, we're, we're, not going to, um, we're not going to craft a plan that would make us liable under ERISA because of the potential risk and liability to the state. And so um, I, I think it's, it, it has to be voluntary for that reason alone. I, yeah, my observation is the way to move it forward in Hawaii is to really do the study. I was impressed with the discussion about, you know, looking at the market, look at the individual sectors, how many, bring, make sure that everybody understands what the problem is by having the numbers, knowing how many people don't have retirement savings. Um, I think you have to create um, and educate people as to the purpose of why you're doing that. So I would say, you know, this next year would definitely be focused on trying to get some legislation passed to really, um, and we'd have to spend some money doing that. We might have to put three, four hundred thousand dollars into a really thorough study, and, and I think that's how you would advance it in Hawaii. Mm -hmm. So the study option is something that you think is a first point in Hawaii. We see as we see in Utah and some of the other states. Well, you know, we're, we're I think we're the most unionized state in the union, and we're probably the most Democrat state in the union, mm -hmm. and. Um, you know, they'll want, I, I mean, I think a lot of the leaders need that kind of information so that what happens is you get that rally of support. Um, they tend not to like new, I like bills thrown in saying you're going to, we're going to do this and they don't know about it. They don't, they tend to resist it automatically. Like, why didn't you ask us or why didn't you bring it to us? Mm -hmm. So that's kind of the political environment we work in. Mm -hmm. And let me just explain why Utah is studying that. I was working with AARP and some other advocacy groups to run a bill for our 2015 session, which ended in March. And at every stage, I got roadblocks because of ERISA. And so rather than running a bill that would potentially fail, mm -hmm. I converted that into a, a study bill, basically. And now we have, uh, at our first two meetings, we've had over 30 people all around the table mostly from private business. We have our 529 plan director there, state treasurer and others, and we're trying to craft a way forward. But <laughs> our main objective is to not fall under ERISA. Mm -hmm. yeah, can I just um, follow up on that a little bit about the ERISA um, issues? I, I, and I wanted to um, just um, touch a bit upon what uh, Senator Mullet was saying earlier about not triggering ERISA in Washington State. And, and what he was referring to was for the state itself to not be subject to ERISA. Our, our design was purposefully set up so that um, we would be under ERISA in the sense that the individual um, business owner who um, decides to have a plan, either a simple IRA or a payroll deduction IRA, will have a relationship with that financial um, securities company that they're buying the product from, and so that does fall under ERISA. So we're, we're trying to have the best of both worlds. We're trying to completely avoid ERISA and completely embrace ERISA at the same time, right? And, and uh, as you were just saying, the, the state has very big concerns about liability. Um, we don't, uh, if you're familiar with the concept of sovereign immunity, in our state we don't uh, use sovereign immunity, whereas many states do, so we get sued a lot and we and we settle a lot because we're afraid of how much that would um, cost us if we went into a court case. So even even in a case where we're 1% liable, we can be responsible for 100% of the damages if somebody else isn't able to pay, like a financial ser securities company that goes out of business for um, operating poorly. So, um, so we're very concerned about uh, ERISA and we're really trying to also though have all the protections and all the benefits of ERISA at the same time. And so I would just suggest as you're thinking about ERISA, and, and mandates, um, one of the things we struggled with is could we mandate employers <coughs> to offer a plan of some sort um, within a r and, and, and operate within ERISA but not have the state being the one to offer that. So that's something that was really unclear from anything that I was able to find. So I uh, kind of touched on it earlier, but ERISA is also a, a challenge in Indiana. I uh, want to make sure um, that we're not putting the state at undue risk. 
Uh, I think, too, when we look at uh, setting this up, uh, the Roth option, uh, I know there's debate about that. The Roth option I feel so strongly about um, because of some of the aforementioned uh, with the folks that are potentially going to be putting money into these accounts, most of them um, are not going to have a savings account at the bank. Uh, the Roth IRA, uh, as it exists, once it's been open for five years, you can pull your principal out without penalty. Uh, that's a real advantage for those folks. Um, now, obviously, uh, and if I was their financial planner, I'd say try to find some other place to pull money from than your retirement. Uh, you're kind of uh, borrowing from Peter to pay Paul. But, um, but at the same time, in an emergency situation, that is um, – that's going to be much more flexible under existing Roth rules than the traditional IRA rules with penalties. And then you end up, uh, you may end up costing uh, the, the employee more than what they're ultimately going to gain out of it. So let's talk a little bit about your, the environment in your states with respect to stakeholders. We've, again, with the state's implementation, they talked about, you know, legislatively what it took for them to, to get a, b a <coughs> bill enacted in their states and where the financial services industry came out and small business groups came out. So if you could just spend a few minutes and, and help us understand sort of how the dynamic is in your state and what you're already seeing and hearing from stakeholders and other, other stakeholders maybe unique to your state that is are coming out either strongly supporting this or resisting this in your state. Um, again, in Utah, you're studying this issue, so you're interacting with various stakeholders, and in the end, already having tried to run legislation and clearly seeing, you know, where certain uh, industries come out on all of this. And Gary, you can certainly speak to a lot of the experience in Washington State. So if you don't mind talking a little bit about sort of how you see the stakeholders lining up in your state sure. as you begin to study and look at this issue. We've had great participation I in the legislation I passed. We invited the uh, Chamber of Commerce, the Association of Independent Insurance Agents, the Insurance Department, the Small Business Development Center, the Certified Public Accountants Association, AARP, and, um, and the banks to, to participate with us. And we've had, um, we've had great uh, participation so far, and I actually am rifling through right now some of the um, notes that I took from our first um, couple, of, uh, couple of meetings. One of our main focuses on has been on how do we keep those management fees low, and we've kind of heard that mm -hmm. as a theme today. Um, we've also learned from a, uh, an employee benefit study that 53.3 percent of small business employers in Utah do not offer retirement plans, and of course, I think like every state, most of our workers work for businesses with under 20 employees. Um, and one thing that I wasn't expecting is um, we've heard a very strong um, call from the business community and these work groups saying um, the state needs to provide incentives for employers um, to participate in this. And I think, of course, if it was mandatory, you wouldn't need the incentives, but we're, we're probably um, you know, not going to be mandatory. And uh, you know, other discussions are, is this the proper role of government? Um, uh, and uh, also the, the servicing and the automatic enrollment and we're dealing with all of, I, I've been shocked to, you know, to listen these last three hours, how similar, uh, you know, what we thought we were, you know, being pioneers uh, in doing in our state. We're just doing the exact same thing that Illinois and Indiana and so many other states are going through. So, pioneer's big in my state, so I, I use that on purpose. <laughs> I think that the people that were engaged on the discussion on minimum wage will be at the table. Um, we raised minimum wage quite a bit, and, and I remember how many, I mean, there was screaming on both sides, um, people that really wanted it and people that didn't want it, and I suspect this will bring the same players out. And if you, any of you have dealt with the minimum wage issue, I think, you know, there was just a lot of people that felt it might harm small business, um, you know, and in the chamber on our island went neutral they didn't want to comment one way or the other because there was a lot of people that believed people's standard of living was being sacrificed because it was too low, so they wanted to see it raised, but they were kind of silent on it because, you know, a lot of the other small business people were saying, no, that means I can't hire enough people. So, I mean, I just think all those players will be, you know, 
be at the table, you know, AARP, you know, um, uh, people that care about the poor, you know, people that care about the working class, and we have the poor work, you know, poor working class, we have low income, moderate income, but, you know, I, again, the I think the thing that really plays out in Hawaii is, is um, the cost of living is just, it, it's really unfortunate, but it really is pretty outrageous. And over the last three to five years, based on um, the fact that we live out in the middle of the Pacific Ocean, is we're dealing with shipping costs. You know, so our cost of food, cost of energy, I mean, cost of water, I mean, it just keeps going up every year. So that will play into the discussion, and that's why I think it would have to be voluntary. Up until this year, we had um, strong, both strong support um, and strong opposition. Um, the opposition, I think I could characterize in two ways. One was basically, this isn't the role of government. There's private sector offering this service. Um, our argument was <coughs> what was made previously, that really there's a market failure, that you have a lot of people that aren't being served. And um, I would um, add to uh, Treasurer Wheeler's earlier comments about the financial services sector, that's the other opposition. The way I sort of saw the breakdown was at the corporate level, w um, the companies would bid on our, our deferred compensation, um, uh, pieces of our deferred compensation. We had a lot of you know, major companies and, and from their perspective, this is great, it's another pool of money we could bid on. At the same time, they, don't, they didn't see it as enough money to really get interested in coming and lobbying for that new pot of money. Uh, but there was huge, strong opposition from the people that sold products, the, the people who represented the um, insurance companies and the people who represented the brokers um, who sold um, retirement plans at the community level. Now, again, they weren't selling many of these products right now to this particular segment of the market. So I think their concern was more of the slippery slope that if the state government can make money, or at least break neutral, break even on selling products to people who can only put in five bucks a month, my goodness, what are they gonna do with my clients if when they get them, right? So there was this fear that, that state government would be taking over their business. And and I made the argument that, you know, we've had a basic health care program in our state. We had had that for years before the um, federal government got uh, active with the issue. And and we weren't looking to serve everybody in health care. We were looking to serve people that didn't have health care, right? And so I said the same thing about uh, retirement savings. You know, we, the state government's not gonna wanna take over this industry, but they are gonna wanna support the people who don't have something. So I think um, to the extent that you can figure out ways to create partnerships, and we were very lucky this last year to have a, a, a sort of an, in an innovative idea. Um, as Senator Mullet mentioned, you work with the industry to come up with sort of a, what, what we hope will be a win-win solution. It's yet to play out. You know, it's a very much an experiment. But we're hoping that um, with their support, we can offer some really good products and have a lot of people um, saving. So, so I think for us, um, what we turn the opposition into into partnership, but it's yet to be seen how well that partnership will play out. Ditto. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, I proper role of government and then fear of of the expansion of government. Um, uh, some would call assistance and some would call intrusion uh, into this into this market. I think is definitely. Something will when when we hit the floor with this and get 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 this concept out of committee. I mean, like I said, we kind of ran out of time last year, and it was the stakeholders having the conversations. And I, I think uh, you know when you look at initial pushback, um, my my guess this is I guess more of a hunch than um, than being actually told this, but I think initial pushback comes from. When you have a group that's not in the industry that they're trying to interact with, put something out there with relatively uh, no collaboration with the industry that it affects or is working with, I think that's probably a, a just a knee-jerk reaction to push back on something like that because you don't know what what are the ulterior motives, you know what what's what's going on here. So w as we as we see other states uh, implement. Um, Indiana at times will lead, but a lot of times will watch and then <laughs> implement. Um, and I, I, I just think, I think as we see that, see some successes, see that things aren't expanding. I mean, uh, like you said, Indiana had a health, uh, healthy Indiana plan um, that I think Iowa copied us, so we led over Iowa anyway on that. Um, 
you know, that was not going after uh, universal health care in the state of Indiana like Massachusetts did. It was just to serve those that needed it most. And so um, I see how this concept can work that way. Um, getting our, our conservative um, constituencies to buy into a government-led effort uh, is, is probably going to be a challenge. It would probably be a challenge. Well, well, let me ask you. I mean, Utah has is is a study state, and you know, a big part is how do you how do you make the case <coughs> for the need for this, right? For people to understand the nature of the problem and the need, so that they understand there's a problem in need of a solution. In in Indiana, um, and you can talk also. Washington State didn't necessarily have a study group, but worked on this various legislative proposals over time. But what do you, what do you, how would you assess sort of the need in terms of legwork ahead of time to sort of set the stage, make the case in order to successfully develop and then move a legislative proposal forward? You can't just sort of drop it without making that case. And where we've seen that happen, things generally have not happened in that first legislative session or second legislative try. So uh, how do you view that in terms of the work that needs to be done in advance, absent a more formal study being done or commission being s set up to do that in Indiana? How, does, how do you see that unfolding? Well, absent a, a study, which I think would be valuable, um, I think the, the collaborations that started to happen towards the middle to end of our session this year with the stakeholders of AARP and NAFA and other industry folks uh, One America is located in Indianapolis, uh, right across the street, Katie Corner from the State House. Mm -hmm. So engaging those folks that would uh, potentially, actually potentially bid on this uh, type of business mm -hmm. um, and helping them understand that. Um, as far as the public side, that's going to be an outreach uh, effort, but I don't know that you do that um, to a full extent until after something's announced or been launched. Mm -hmm. But um, the as, the as you think about this, I mean, what are the what are the questions in your mind that are unanswered with respect to your state and assessing the magnitude of the problem and the and the best solutions? Well, I think um, un unanswered. The biggest unanswered question is how the, the how the general assembly will will react to it because not everybody knew about it. It was uh, I'm on the insurance committee uh, vice chair and the chairman was the one that filed the bill and uh, you know he and I um, you know are, are good friends he was my mentor and all that so he and I really spearheaded the conversations and really hasn't been a, a big um, conversation yet with the overall general assembly so I think that's a first first stop and I think a study may come of that um, uh, but you know um, I, I don't see it out of the realm of being able to be enacted um, if if we have if we have all the stakeholders you know if we don't have a, a an outpouring of people against it mm -hmm. like some of the other states have dealt with that that were leaders um, I don't see to where that couldn't if it was you know uh, presented in the right way couldn't be enacted soon and so given the 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 need to work with some of the stakeholders and sort of have them buy into this. Um, what do you? What would be helpful in Indiana to help working with those stakeholders and changing the terms of that debate? Well, I think the work is happening. What will be helpful is getting a hearing <laughs> to, to actually get some actual public testimony and get mm -hmm. that out into the media and and see what kind of reactions we get because that step hasn't even happened yet. Mm -hmm. So I think I think that that's where you'll start get constituent responses as media picks it up and. Um, that's where we'll start seeing where the pushback mm -hmm. is outside of industry and stakeholders. Mm -hmm. right. Gary, you have any thoughts, observations about the stakeholders? Yeah. Y the, uh, the thing I would say about our state was, um, depending on the version of the bill that was introduced, <coughs> made a huge difference in who was interested in supporting uh, in a very active way. So as, as you've heard, our most recent bill was um, in collaboration with the financial services industry and just having them on board, th there was really no opposition from anybody else. There were a few concerns expressed by a few organizations, but they were pretty minimal and um, easily worked through. Um, prior to that, um, there was, a, there was and, and, this, and this particular version, um, whereas labor had been very interested in supporting more of a state-run program in the past sessions, in this session they were kind of like, well, 
may be okay, but they weren't really sure if they trust the financial services, services industry to offer these plans, and they were more comfortable with the state offering a solution. So they were less actively involved, but uh, AARP has been involved throughout. A few small business organizations have been involved throughout. I think those are key. I think whatever um, way you craft your legislation, if you are able to at least get some, sec some portion of the financial services sector um, supporting it, it helps to um, balance the, sec the part of the sector that might be against it. So I would uh, certainly recommend that. Senator Weil, do you have any observations in terms of making of the case and as you undertake the study in your state, sort of maybe how you envision the, the output of that and what you think needs to be there in order to lead hopefully to a legislative proposal? Yeah, I, I, I think the, the statistics and the facts make the case. Um, the resolution that I ran for the study committee uh, was passed unanimously or nearly unanimously. We have one House member in Utah that always votes against every resolution as a matter of principle. <laughs> um, I'm in the Senate. But um, I, I, I don't, I think if we can come up with a, um, a bill that it does not make the state unduly liable um, and that, you know, the, I, I think the selling point is if, if people are eight times more likely to, you know, or less likely to save for retirement if it's not available through their employment and the result is they're going to be more dependent on the state and federal government when they retire, that's the case. And, and I think um, my colleagues in the Utah legislature get that. I, I do think we'll have a few Tea Party or Libertarian leaning Republicans say this isn't the proper role of government, like they say on everything we do, right. um, bless their hearts. But I don't, I don't foresee a problem passing this bill. And I, I usually pass the most bills or the second most bills in Utah, at least in the four sessions I've had. In fact, this this year I passed uh, Utah's Able Act bill. Um, we were the third state in the country to pass Able Act enabling legislation. So. Um, how, uh, how do you view, I mean, uh, you know, we've had discussions and with the Assistant Secretary and sort of the GOL ERISA issue. Uh, does that have any impact on, in terms of timing or how will I you think move so. on the 2016 I session or 2017? Yeah, our, our, our session starts in January. I mean, Congress passed uh, the ABLE Act in December and we passed, uh, and we had, I, I, I counted yesterday, the day before, I think there were 30 states that have already passed ABLE Act enabling legislation, mm -hmm. and Congress just did that in December. Right. And so I do think states, unlike the federal government, have the ability to, to react mm -hmm. quickly, especially if you're already gearing up for it. One of the, the interesting things I heard uh, earlier in the discussion was that the federal government cannot grant any type of waivers to ERISA because I happen to also sit on our Health and Human Services Appropriations Committee, and you know we get grants daily for um, you know education and Medicaid and so many other things, which were also passed by Congress. So I'm not I'm not sure why that <laughs> that uh, philosophy doesn't carry over to ERISA, but statutory. Well, we can make a new statute, <laughs> but, <laughs> but I, I I take I take the I, I take her at her word that 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 is the status quo. But maybe that's something we should be looking at as well. influences perhaps the thinking and the timing in Indiana? Uh, I mean, I, I, would I would agree with what, what you said, Todd. I mean, it's um, a risk. The federal, you know, federal always kind of has its, its um, rulemaking uh, superiority on some of this stuff, and so we always have to be cognizant of that, and having you know, clear guidance is going to be key for sure in Indiana. Mm -hmm. With the assistant secretary here, I certainly can't miss the opportunity to make a couple comments. Um, <laughs> so, so th there was a question earlier about multi-employer plans and the uh, uh, multiple employers. Okay, multiple employers. So, yeah. and and I'm not an expert anyway on this, but as I understand it, um, <coughs> in an industry, for example, you can have a multiple employer plan, um, um, maybe that a union operates for um, plumbers, and it's uh, one one plan for a number of employers that uh, operate under the union. And I know, um, in working with the city of Seattle, we were talking with um, someone that they do investments with, and they were talking about the federal level, how they were going to try to push for allowing small businesses to be organized as a group 
under a multiple employer plan, and they felt that that would give them the economies of scale to be able to um, offer something more, much more cost effective. And I think that might be the, the heart of the question that was perhaps that was being asked earlier. And, 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 and so, and, oh, and I was just going to say, and, and the, 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 the thing ab that, that is in terms of a state um, collaborating with financial services sector, if there are ways to be able to um, not have the state have to be the um, operator and that have the state be under ERISA, but maybe have some other company being able to do that, let's say, Fidel let's say they contract with Fidelity or Vanguard or somebody to offer this um, state plan, but then the relationship is directly between all those small businesses and that company that gets starts all the ERISA problems. So this is a very complicated area of law. I'll try to make it simple. <laughs> there, we've now mixed two different kinds of plans. There, there basically are three, this is ERISA 101. There are basically three kinds of plans covered under ERISA. The first is the one you know most commonly, a single employer plan where a single company provides benefits for its employees. It might, if it's a multiple line of business, they might have affiliates and they're all under one plan or different plans. So that's single employer, a corporate plan. I, in these aggregation of employees, uh, employer type arrangements, there are two very distinct ones. One is a, mo and why Congress wasn't more creative to come up with terms that didn't engender confusion, I, I don't know. One is called a multiple employer plan. The other one is called a multi-employer plan. Let me take the second one first. A multi-employer plan is defined under ERISA, and these definitions are in the Internal Revenue Code as well, as a collectively bargained plan involving more than one employer, and they're basically under the same collective bargaining agreement. So you do have you know, when I was in private practice, I represented, for instance, the plumber and pipe fitter plan. You have, uh, you know, various building and construction plans. And in that, the unifying principle, in those multi-employer plans, the unifying principle is they're all under a single collective bargaining agreement. Um, distinguished from a multiple employer plan, in a multiple employer plan, you have a whole bunch of unrelated employee employers um, that can band together, even under the current ERISA rules, they can band together and provide a plan. And then what they do is provide an administrative structure, mm -hmm. which you know sounds remarkably like what you're thinking about on the state uh, or have adopted on the state law. Now, in a multiple employer context, it's not a collectively bargained plan, it's a bunch of unrelated employers. Under the Department of Labor regulations, there, ha there has to be a unifying factor. And that commonality requirement is what gives, for instance, chambers of commerce the ability to offer a single plan in the state. You know, uh, the Montana auto dealers, the uh, Hawaii Bankers Association, because there's the commonality requirement is actually a consumer protection because what it does is it assures that one of the important tenets of ERISA, which is no service provider should be able to set its own compensation, is satisfied when you have a, an association that in essence can negotiate with the service provider to provide services. There is a move, and there has been some movement in the financial services industry to push what they call our open MEPs, and what that would mean is there would be no commonality requirement. You might ask, how is that any different from an insurance company uh, who sells products to a whole bunch of different employers? The difficulty we have with that at the Department of Labor, there's legislation that might implement that. We've had a lot of people ask about that. That really was what our friends at Russell were asking in the earlier question of me. The problem is that there's no consumer protection in that. And what you actually have, if you have a service provider that can put together an arrangement where they can basically aggregate all these un unrelated employers, they can basically set their own compensation. So at the Department of Labor, we've resisted this open MEP concept because we think 
that all of these arrangements, if they're going to get favorable tax treatment, they need to have some consumer protection in there. So what I was suggesting this morning that we were going to be working on is, in fact, a variant on this open net arrangement. Because if you think about it, there's really no commonality ex among these small businesses, except they happen to you know, operate in the same state. That isn't a sufficient commonality to allow a private sector entity, a financial services entity, to provide these benefits. On the other hand, the state, the state would provide the consumer protection. And that's really why what we're thinking about here is an arrangement where the state um, is basically takes the responsibility. I always like to describe it as the state is the one on whose desk, which is what the state had a desk, that Harry Truman, the buck stops here, signed last. So that ultimately the state is responsible. If the state wants to, in implementing something like this, you know, delegate it to somebody else, who then is responsible, you know, stands in the shoes of the state, that, you know, depending on how the guidance is structured, that may be okay. But this is really complicated because Congress wasn't creative enough to create different names that distinguish this. Um, so that's really what I was talking about this morning. But since I have the microphone, is it okay, Angela, if I just make one other co set of comments? I was just gonna say one more. <laughs> so <laughs> people have, I was gonna do it anyway, because Angela. <laughs> I do that too. So, um, Typical federal government. I realize, <laughs> I realize that after Fran and I had our dialogue earlier today, that what I didn't do, I talked to you about the kind of consumer protections we think that whatever the states do, they ought to have. So I thought I might give you just a couple of quick examples of the kind of consumer protections that both the people in the previous panel and you as you're thinking about how you want to structure them have to think about. The first is a really important consumer protection that honestly, I will say, where's Julian? Is he still here? Julian is the, the state of Illinois is the only state that I'm aware of that raised this issue with me, or, or I raised and they said we had thought about it. And this is what I call chasing the contributions. Obviously it's efficient to have a payroll deduction mechanism to make sure that the contributions are there. However, at the Department of Labor, we spend an extraordinary amount of our enforcement resources chasing those contributions because they're dutifully withheld from the employee's paycheck and sometimes they don't make it to the 401k plan or to the health plan in either in time or at all. So you need to be careful. Um, if you've got an ERISA plan, you don't have to worry about it because we have rules under ERISA as to who's responsible and how quickly you have to make those contributions, et cetera. But if, you're, if the state is thinking about an IRA, a non-ERISA approach, mm -hmm. You need to think about how you have a mechanism to make sure that that money gets there. Remember, the kinds of employers that you're talking about are, are very tiny by and large. I mean, Hawaii, I, when I was a congressional staff person, I worked for Pat Williams from Montana. Virtually every employer in Montana was a small business, under 10, a lo lot under five, some under three. Um, and that is a, per they, they don't have sophisticated pay, they're sophisticated people, but they don't have sophisticated payroll systems. They often use the turnkey system and sometimes that works and sometimes that doesn't. So think about what kind of mechanism you can build into your program that will assure that those contributions that are taken from people's paychecks eventually get there. Because the last thing you want whether your governor is Republican, Democrat, conservative, liberal, socialist, um, is for people's money to not get to where it's going because God knows that person in that governor's chair is not gonna be the governor at the next election if that happens. So that's one issue. A second issue has to do with the fees that are charged for these investment things. You know, the department, one of, I'm very proud of one of our major initiatives in this administration in which we now require for the very first time that 
the financial services products that are offered to people through their 401ks and other kinds of employee benefit plans, there are two levels of this fee disclosure. People need to know and employers need to know how much they're paying for these investment options because the fees can make a huge difference. You saw that in Diane's presentation. I know you all know. So you need to, we weren't able, because we lacked statutory authority, to extend, extend these fee disclosure rules to IRAs. So if you're, if you're putting in a program in which people are investing in IRAs, you need to think about how you're going to assure that they have all the information they need about what these investments cost. Because target if you've seen one target date fund, you've seen one target date fund. Everybody thunk, thinks about target date funds like they're the panacea. The range of costs, the associated fees associated with target date funds are dramatically different. So think about fee disclosure. Um, and you can do that through your RFP when you get to the to the point where you're actually uh, implementing the program, or you can do it through legislation. So that's the second one. And one last one, and I'll stop. Um, the third one has to do with um, our major project now, which is um, trying to establish a baseline legal obligation on people who hold themselves out to be trusted retirement invest advisors that they have a legal obligation to put their clients first. And again, Julie and I was encouraged first and then worried by your second answer about these conversion things. The biggest problem we see um, in terms of conflicted advice is in this rollover context. Uh, because you have people who already have, they may be the record keeper for the 401k plan, they may be you know, the person who's off the financial services entity that's offering the, the IRA. And so if you've got your, as, as Julian was talking about, in the secure choice model, um, they have a rule in the, in the Illinois uh, program that suggests that people can't use that already established relationship with the client mm -hmm. as a way to encourage them to move to their products. Mm -hmm. um, one of the reasons many, many of the big companies in the country support our rule is exactly because of this rollover, because they've discovered that in about 50% of the cases, the people who leave, take the money out of the 401k and go to an IRA, miraculously wind up in a 401k product offered by the record keeper. And the, s the call center is often the main mechanism that you need to focus your attention on. So just those three things, chasing the money, fee disclosure, and think about um, any kind of protections that you might want to build in in terms of retirement advice. Those are just three simple ones. Those are very helpful. Thank you. And before we go to questions, I just want to remind everybody you're missing the debate right now. <laughs> <laughs> My wife's DVRing it for me. Hi, this is Diane Oakley. I just had one one comment and thought from some of the research that NERS has done. When we ask people about the retirement crisis, we ask them, "What was your strategy to deal with it?" And maybe this can help you with the building some constituency among the small business communities. And, and if you're studying it, make sure you ask the question like this. Because what we heard from three-fourths of the people were, when I retire, I am going to cut back my spending. And so what that means, and where retirees spend their money, turns out to often be places where small businesses, you know, a lot of small businesses are small local restaurants in your community. And all of a sudden, if they're going to cut back their spending, one of the first places they do that is, you know, for example, not going out to dinner or something in that regard. So I think if you can build up among the small business a sense that ultimately what this legislation is designed to do is to make sure that re when people retire, they have the resources to keep a little bit better of their standard of living, which means in our consumer economy, because the one thing we know about retirees is when you give them money, they spend it. 
you know, that's one thing that's really, really clear. We know, and I think, um, I think Illinois' numbers about some of that economic impact, we've done economic impact statements on defined benefit plans, and we know for every dollar that goes to a retiree, they generate a dollar and 98 cents of economic output. So that type of data and that getting that type of message out in a broader way, I think, can be a helpful issue and point to think. Thank you. Let me tee off of that. I think that's an excellent point. I also think that a lot of our small business owners, at least in my state of Utah, they just, it's a bandwidth issue. They're trying to run their business. They're not lawyers. There's so much paperwork with this. I, it's a bandwidth thing. And there also, we heard, I think, from Mark Mullet, Mullet this morning about the fees. You know, he owns a pizza shop and an ice cream shop. And I'm thinking, not the best, uh, maybe, nutritional advice we could get from a state yeah, center. But, but, um, but I think it's bandwidth. I think most of the small business owners that I've talked to, um, it, it they just don't have the time um, to deal with it. It's not that they don't want to. It's just a bandwidth. I think individuals fall into that category, too. I mean, you're, you're working sometimes two Absolutely. jobs. Absolutely. Yeah, two jobs to make ends meet. And last thing you're thinking about is 40 years from now. So the, the, the question I have is, are we selling this to small businesses or are we s selling it to all generations? Millennials, Gen Xs, Gen Ys, you know. You know again, what's your target, kind of your target audience? Because one of the things that we've been discussing quite a bit is how do you communicate across generational lines? Because the way you communicate to Gen X is not the same way you communicate to millennials and who knows what that next generation, how they want to be communicated to. So you may have to go Facebook, Twitter, internet. So if communication is a big piece and you're trying to go across on, you know, if that's your, you know, so who all are we selling it to, I guess, is the bigger question. And if it's across all lines, then we're going to have to figure out as policymakers how to communicate to all those different age groups. Because one of the things, I've been to a lot of seminars on this recently is we have to learn how to communicate differently to those different groups. So Angela, we've, we've got a request to uh, maybe continue this conversation at the reception. Okay.